So, hello. Uh, just for something about myself very quickly, I'm a software engineer and uh, I'm very enthusiastic. I worked in compilers, just in time compilers, especially in the V8 team in Google, and now working on virtual reality on the web. So, lots of interesting things. And I need to do also DevOps in my life. So, DevOps now, uh, thinking about building and deployment, it means lots of Docker everywhere, which is generally good, it's amazing, but if you do it day by day, I, any, I dare you, I double dare you say I must wait for Docker build to complete one more time. And after I waited for the build, should I also wait for Docker pool and getting old at that? So my sense is Docker is almost there, run is this fast, the deployment is deterministic, but it's almost there. Docker build is slow, you cannot do it every minute, every time you save your file. And image layers waste a lot of space, so again, Docker pool is slow. Can we fix it? And my idea is that the Docker file system layers are large. They do not share space between builds because one layer is just a big bunch of files and every time you change just one single file, you have to rebuild the whole layer anyway. And uh, this is because the model changes sequentially and not directly contents. So the idea is that we should use a content addressable storage instead. It's a content addressable file system, ideally accessible remotely over the network and usable with fuse inside a container, where all Albir steps are stored, but uh, hashed block by block, so that it can share spare space massively. And in each container, we should mount this read-only. So I have a system, it's, it's a prototype, it's called the Functional File Tree Transformations, where functional is like functional programming. The idea is that builds happen in a build environment, and this environment is mostly a file tree, and each build step mutates a file tree, but this sounds imperative. In a functional setup, each build step is a function that takes a file tree as input and gives a file tree as output. And instead of mutation, you should ideally generate entirely new file trees, which since you have the content addressable store, you are sharing space, so it's really very cheap and very efficient. And so a build, the whole build, is like a functional composition, but at this point, you can apply all the optimization for functional programming, like especially caching partial results, memoization in functional programming. So the idea here is that you should use Docker, but you should do it wisely. So, uh, you start from a base image, and then when you do builds, you should isolate each single build step, even small steps, like just build one single file, in a separated container. We should start very fast, build the input read-only, sorry, mount the input read-only, build the output, and capture the output, and snapshot that inside the content addressable storage, so that you can really cache every computation. And at that point, what happens is that builds are insanely fast, because incremental builds, when you develop, are doable. They are, they are something like milliseconds build, literally. And deployments are also very fast because there is no Docker pool anymore. You just bind mount with fuse a separated hash from the file system, which means you can redeploy again, probably in half a second or something like that. Just the time to restart a process because starting a container is like starting a process at that point. Which means that using this system as a build system, uh, between the choice, of, of a fast system and a correct system, you can pick both. This is mostly like Bazel, which is a build system like Google, th that Google did, but uh, with a twist that is language independent and everything runs in containers. So all the builds run in containers, all the deployments are in containers, the environment is the same, the development environment is exactly the same as the deployment environment, because usually what you do is you deploy using your, a container orchestrator, uh, and uh, Docker for containers or whatever, but when you develop, every time you save a file and you want to run the system, you need to do some trick to make it fast. You cannot use the production system. I don't think anybody is actually using say, Kubernetes on their laptops doing a redeploy at every file save. This is not going to work in practice. You wish you could do it because you would have the same system that you have in production, but you can't. Now with a system like this, you could, uh, which means that everybody knows the deployment system very well because everybody uses it every day in the laptop. So these, these are sort of the advantages, the ideas. So if you are interested, you can, now this is just five minutes. There are a lot of engineering issues there. I have taught all of them through, but I don't have time to explain them. So if you're interested, we can talk about it. There is a proof of concept on GitHub. We could hack together in the gap day or whatever. And wow, I finished it earlier than the five minutes. <laughs> so. 
So now I'd like to talk about Don't Reinvent the Infrastructure, or uh, IAAM. We'll see what is it about. So if you can answer this question, but I really, sorry, I don't know. What is your business? It's probably some, some service, or maybe you do something online, e-commerce, or you produce something, or you maybe write software, but I really don't know. So, and what do you do? Again, I think you write some kind of business, which I don't know, but I'm not alone. We are building systems we don't fully understand, as been previously said by one of speaker today. So, what do you think I'm gonna to talk about? Uh -huh. Infrastructure as a magic. So, why? <laughs> why I'm doing this? Right, okay, I, I've been working with infrastructure for some time, and uh, I see repetitive things, so that's why I want to kind of uh, put some information even more. So, you are expert in your business. I'm quite certain that you know how to run business, why you created this business, what is this business for, who are your customers, how to sell your products. That's good, so Chuck Norris would be happy. So, but uh, I guess you are running business. You are probably also writing some code, you are running it, maintaining it, operating it, putting some monitoring, whatever else is required, and luckily this is called DevOps. So you can say that you've been running business and DevOps on parallel. So you already know magic and coding because you are, or most of you are uh, developers. So you learn basics of Git, you know your programming language of choice, you drink coffee, you get your work done, profit. So there are some still magic and infrastructure which is very important to understand. And even today we've heard several talks about it and uh, some speakers told us that DDoS is not uh, science fiction, but it really happens. And distributed tracing is important. And overall, what we've heard about architecture is real. So uh, when you're thinking about your infrastructure wise, uh, you can think about it as something that, uh, oh no, it's so special for my business, I cannot even talk to you, sorry. but. Uh, I'm making such a cool product that it's really awesome and I really need a dedicated person who, who knows all details of all these hardcore networking things for my product to be successful. In most cases, like literally 99%, it's not the case. You will be enough with basic network resources, basic network architecture, high availability, uh, is very well described on different white papers and so on. The same goes for security and access controls. You, your business, most likely, is not uh, needing anything uh, so special or so extra advanced which is not uh, created or already available in the community. So I listed two ways of getting help from the community. One is community modules, uh, where I am kind of sh shameless plug, I'm a uh, maintainer. But second one is the power of using community search on GitHub. You can actually search for files by extension, and you can see how other people solve similar problems uh, just by going to advanced search. I'm amazed by the amount of people who, uh, who forked common uh, network, Terraform network module more than 150 times it's really hard to imagine what these people were putting into it, but uh, there were people who are uh, thinking that they're special and they want to make something out of it. So I encourage you to just uh, use open source and use community solutions. And one more time, it's better to follow best practices and learn from mistakes by others. That's all, thanks. Okay, so I'm Jorge Barata, and uh, I'm full stack. What is to be a full stack engineer? So we are going to start with a, with a web app, and in order to do so, we are going to, we need to know the design patterns, MVC, you know, about user experience, REST, data persistence, uh, and so we are going to, to our web app, we are going to add a database. Uh, 
and we are going to deploy it into a host, uh, and we are going to put it in front of a web server. So, and we are going to start shipping. We're going to give to start giving updates to the to the web app. So we need version control. We need to have every, all the tests, and we are going to automate the deployment. That starts to get a bit tricky because we don't want downtime in our in our in our servers. Uh, we are going to start learning about, about processes, memory. Keep, we need to make sure that the host doesn't run out of memory. We are going to learn about demons. Uh, we're going to learn about zombies. Uh, it starts to get epic. Uh, then we are going to need to instrumentalize to, to, all, to take all this. And we are going to, to need all these tools to also debug. And today I learned something. I didn't know about this. If you want to check, it's a funny, funny thing to do. So, and you're going to start scaling. Uh, in order to scale, you have this monolith. You are going to put more, to move it to web host, and you are going to move the database outside and put everything in front of a load balancer. And you see, you, you start, this starts to multiply. Keep this in mind. Uh, and then you have a set of hosts. You start learning about VP, VPNs, uh, TCP, DNS, and you're going to. You need to keep in mind the security as well. You're going to do the penetration test, SQL injection. Keep, uh, you are going to learn about its KCD. You are going to you are going to face robots, and robots have no mercy with you. You are you, they even don't don't respect the spirit also. Asimov. Uh, keep learning with security. Face more challenges. Uh, you are going to have DD, general services attacks. As today we've learned, you you can the web cameras can. Can be you know, there's a whole set of cameras that is going to make you a DNS service attack, and even worse in the future we're going to have a, a full set of toasters that are going to to make you uh, a DNS service attack. And then you are going to have humans, more humans working with you. You are going to cooperate with them. You you need to have branches, peer peer reviews, and you are going to accept standards. You are going to accept standards like uh, well, you are going to use GitHub and accepting the standards. For example. This, this is not cute. There is a standard there that says that this animal is cute. It's a, it's a cat with, with tentacles. I don't know how this is standard. I, mean, I, I can't accept that as standard, for example, for me. You are going to learn who is this squirrel. You are going to, there's people that have to search for that because it's not obvious what, what is it. And then you keep scaling and you have a, a, a full fleet of, of, of machines there. And you still have the problem with zero downtime and you are going to need to start orchestrating. And you're going to start feeling the power because you're going to have hundreds of machines under your control. But your stack keeps growing and you're going to have a mobile app, mailing, caching queues, you're going to add a search engine, start using machine learning, recommendation, and you're going to introduce microservices so all the stack is going, you're going to replace the whole monolith with something like this. Then you're going to, ah, and then you're also the front end, we are, we are full stack. So in the front end, we are going to face a lot of technologies for JavaScript, a lot, and CSS, even more like all this, Webpack. We are going to do optimizations with mini, mini, minimization, of compression, tree staking, very important the tree staking. You are going to, and you are going to feel like you are going to deploy, you have to have uh, progressive web apps. You are going to deploy a full, remotely a full automated robot in, 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 in the browser. So it's like send, sometimes I feel with all that stack of technologies, I'm sending a big robot to deploy itself in the, in the browser of the client. And the important thing is here is you have to keep, keep learning. Keep learning, get up to speed with all the technologies. And if you, I don't know if you notice it, but with all the technologies that I said here, you, could do, you, you, you can try to be a, become a Pokemon master because there are a lot of animals here. You can do a Pokemon rap. It's, you can find the, what's, the, what's that, by the way? I don't know what's that. The Python is a bit abstract. You need to, but it's up, there are two Pythons there. Uh, PHP, Postgre, Hadoop. They are not evolutions. They are independent Pokemon. <laughs> this is Grunt, Bower, and you also have GitLab. That is a, uh, uh, that's not open source, but it's a monster as well, as I said before. It's, it's, so it, it enters here as well. Keep learning, please. <laughs> All right, time is already running, so good. Um, yeah, I want to give you a quick overview over uh, GraphFQL, but before we start, um, give me like a show of hands. Who has used GraphQL? Quick, quick, up, up. All right, all right. That's good. So you, I just don't know about it really, right? Good. So 
GraphQL is basically was developed by, by Facebook to build better APIs, to be more flexible, be more modern, and be suitable for mobile apps and legacy clients because they had a lot of those issues. And with GraphQL, you can have left, less traffic, less network requests, and just in general will have a better, well-formed API. And since probably most of you know REST, we should probably compare it to GraphQL. So on the left-hand side, we have REST. REST has multiple routes. We have gets and posts and deletes, and we use the HTTP verbs to determine what we're going to do with them. We write our, geez, write our own docs, more or less, somehow, maybe sometimes generated, sometimes not. We have implicit contracts between the client and the server, so we have to agree on something. And we sideload our relations, which, me which means we have usually more requests for relationships and embedded documents and stuff like that. We have fixed responses, so everything looks the same all the time, and if we don't like it, well, problem. And therefore, we need API versioning if we have legacy clients or uh, mobile apps that can't really develop, be developed as fast as, as web apps, for instance. And we don't have types, so we have to do a validation on our server, because basically we can receive all data we want. It, there's like no validation whatsoever, usually. Whereas with GraphQL, we have just one endpoint. It's always post, and it's just that one endpoint. Um, the docs can be generated from the schema we already have, because we have to define a schema, so we can generate the docs, and they're always up to date. We have explicit contracts, so there's no way to send wrong data, there's no way to receive wrong data. It's totally like in the contract. We can embed relations, so it's always just one request to get all the things we need. We have very flexible results, so we get all the, just the data we need and not like everything from a user, for instance. And therefore, we don't need versioning if we do it the, wrong, uh, the right way. Because like, if we tell the, the server what we want, we can have old clients, new clients, and they can all use what they need. And since we have static typing, we have um, decent data that arrives on the server already, so we don't really have to validate like, at least not the types. So now you probably think, like, right, uh, nice, I guess, but what, how, how do I use this, right? So um, let's have a demo. Shit. Sorry. Um, so this is the graph EQL interface, which is, like, free, and, it, like, you can install it yourself. And it's pointing to the GitHub uh, GraphQL database or API, which you can use for free as well and play around with it. So when you look at it, you probably think, like, what? What is this? So basically, on the upper right-hand corner, you have docs. And you open them, you have those generated docs I just told you about. And there on the bottom, you see search, which is the one I executed on the left. And the right-hand side is the response. So the search has like a first, after, stuff like that for a pagination. And then we have a query string and a type, which are both uh, required because it has an exclamation mark. So we know what we need to send, how it's, how it's structured, and what we get. We get a search result item connection, and you click, can click on the stuff, and you know exactly what you're getting. So I know how to um, generate this, the query on the left-hand side by looking at the docs. And also, GraphQL helps you because it's like an IDE, so if I type repo, it actually um, expands everything for me. So I know if it doesn't expand, um, I probably did it wrong. Um, I can also be very flexible, so I cannot only tell them, tell the server what type of attributes I want or what attributes. I can also tell how I want them to be named, so which is really nice for legacy clients and mobile apps and the like. But what about errors, right? So errors are just a part of the response as well, uh, and it can include both GraphQL errors, like for types, or um, server errors as well. And if you want to change data or create data, you need to have mutations. Um, which are also be found in the docs, and there's like a bunch for GitHub, like add stars and add comments and stuff like that. And if you just go through the docs again, you see how it's done. So it like, looks pretty much like a query, but it has the mutation keyword, and then you can also specify the response. So if you feel, feel like, well, I'm in, that's nice. Um, please feel free to come to me after the talk and ask a few questions, and thanks for listening. Hola, me llamo Hugo, and uh, that's all the Spanish I'm going to do uh, in this talk. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, what I call one-click setup. I'm going to tell you what it is, uh, why, or how you would do it, and uh, why I think you should do it. Uh, first of all, though, a bit about me. I'm from Sweden originally. I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. And I know that's the Union Yak, but the Scottish flag is not in the Moji standard just yet. 
I work at Skyscanner, and yes, we are hiring, and we're sponsoring, so we're just outside the door. So, let's play a game. Imagine i am just joined your team. It's my first day, I wanna clone your repo, I wanna commit my first code, push to production, you know, deploy it. I want you to think about the number of steps it would take me to do this, and how long that would take, All right? So show of hands, who thinks I could do that in less than 15 minutes? Who thinks I could do it in less than one hour? Less than four hours? Less than one workday? Less than one week. <laughs> right, so you know how Amazon has this uh, one-click checkout button that they invented? And the whole idea is that you click it and you immediately go from looking at a product to it being shipped and on its way to your door. Your repository and your project should have the same thing. It should, for, uh, like, for me as a new engineer, I should be able to go from having the repo clone to running it locally in a single step, ideally in like 15 minutes to an hour. Really though, it's not one click, it's probably more like one command, like you know, run, uh, I don't know, start or install. Um, so that's, that's what we're going for here. So the question is, how do we achieve this? Um, the first step is quite simple, it's like a common one, automate. Imagine, I imagine that maybe you currently have like a long checklist of stuff to do, right? Get a clone of the database, uh, install Postgres, because you need a dynamic library, et cetera. Automate all those steps. They can all be automated. There's no point in humans doing them. Uh, the other one is using reproducible builds. So just like you have infrastructure for code for production, you should have infrastructure for code for development. So that could mean uh, using Docker and Docker Compose files to just spin up in a full environment with just Docker Compose up. It could mean using Vagrant, or in the worst case, it could mean using pre-baked virtual machines so you can just load in uh, and start. And also follow the path of least surprised. If you're in the NPM ecosystem, you can use like an NPM post install cook to do any other setups. Because if I clone a JavaScript project, I'm going to run NPM install instinctively. And if that also does a bunch of custom work that you know we need to do, that's great. Uh, so why would you do this? So the thing that Amazon discovered, right, with purchases and why they created a the one-click button is friction causes abandonment. In their case, it causes cart abandonment, but people will start building up a shopping cart and then never check out. And you get the same thing, right? Imagine I'm working on uh, a different project but, and a di different team from you, but I find something in your code base that could be better. And I say, this looks like a two, three minute fix. I wanna go help you, I wanna go set this up. But if it takes me an hour and like 20 steps to set the code base up, that's friction. I'm never gonna do that. But if it takes me one command and just waiting a bit, I'm more likely to do this. And this becomes more and more relevant as we scale out into microservices, because you will have more projects. But also, like at Skyscanner scale, we're almost 600 engineers, and we have hundreds of code bases. So the number of times you have to set up a project increases with the number of code bases and the number of people. Uh, you also have fewer bugs, because your environment is reproducible. It means you don't, like the, the works on my machine case kind of disappears, and it also means like, the environment from dev to dev and from dev to production is gonna be more similar, again, fewer bugs. Also, you'll have happier developers because like, who likes being a machine and following a 20-step list like step by step? That's boring and demotivating. So uh, to recap, make your setup one step. Ideally, make it take less than 15 minutes of active time, meaning time where you spend, like, you spend actively doing something. Make it take less than one hour of work clock time, so like just sitting waiting. And I implore you, take a project and try setting it up for yourself on a blank VM and see how many issues you hit, and then go back and fix it. That's it. So we all love the stories about major at war apps. Um, this is one of them. Um, about myself, I do work as an IT project manager for a huge uh, language traveling abroad company. On the marketing area, I'm responsible of uh, making you click on those ads that you see everywhere, so we actually get more money, so I'm one of the bad guys. And when I joined the company, the idea, they brought me over for a project that was around for three years and they couldn't launch. So. This is the project itself. 
It's an in-house CMS uh, for the digital advertising team, serving landing pages to 32 countries in their local language. Two million users a month, which is not huge, uh, they must reflect the changes immediately to the final users, any change they do, and this is one of the key parts in here, um, using only two T2 dot medium EC2 servers. If you don't know, this is AWS, so this is servers with only four gigabytes to CPUs, two web servers with a load balancer. And the key point is that it had to be delivered ASAP, this project. So we went with a catch system on these two servers on memory. The memory of the server, we just catch it over there to serve it quicker to the user, help the systems not to have a big load. A Snapchat ads launched in early May, 161 million active users a day, uh, and there is no technical documentation on their sites. I, I could only find a PDF around the internet. I asked them, hey, do you have any technical documentation about your ads? They had nothing. So, first symptoms. Uh, it's a Sunday morning, I'm bottle feeding my six month old baby, and I receive a call from my manager that we were actually, Google was rejecting all our ads. This happens when your systems are down and I didn't get any alert about this. It was strange, so I connect, blank pages everywhere, no errors, no anything, sick. Um, and I couldn't access to the console, it just kept timing out. The facts that we know, I did engage, so one important um, keynote for me was the one for, from Aish, which speaks about having the key people on the on the call. He called it uh, engineering commander, maybe. So I did, uh, I asked my boss to just go away from the calls, just like, we don't need you here. We get the developers. Um, I only got the developers. We finally get the logs, and we see all of that. All of them share the same user agent. That's a strange. The DOS cannot be. Normally, it's a botnet, so different user agent. And this is the key. After about three hours, I involve another key person, another subject expert, which is one of the digital advertising managers. And she tells me, I uploaded two Snapchat ads to the platform, only two. We have about 15,000 ads running every time. And she only uploaded two. The reality, so we got 3.8 million visits in 12 hours. As you can imagine, the system were not ready for this. They were not real visitors. Snapchat prefetched every page, the, the pages that were linked for every ad display, as they had 161 million users. So we showed the ad to 3.8. Those are actu active users for your server. Only 38,000 uh, people actually engaged with the ad, which is not much. Um, tips. Have some hierarchy system. As I say, uh, you need to keep control of it. If you keep bringing people in, it will be a mess. Always prepare for the worst. Now we have a CDN in place, which is the key that they told me to be delivered as ASAP. We didn't have any external catch system. Now we have a CDN, which I'm not going to mention, but this happened. Now we have a Snapchat ads running. No problem at all. Train your users. If I told the digital advertising managers that how the system works, maybe they told me before, hey, I'm gonna upload this, and train yourself on typing with one hand while you are both feeding. Maybe you are gonna need it one day. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I work at Nexmo as a JavaScript developer advocate. You may find me or saw me at the booth outside this. And the reason I'm gonna talk today about t-shirts is, well, my, my Twitter handle says I do stuff for t-shirts, I get asked a lot, so I figured why not tell the story in front of 500 people. Uh, I also do open source, I'm involved with Mozilla, I volunteer for them, but uh, this wasn't really the case uh, all the time. This is a, a story of how I uh, got involved in open source. It, it starts like seven years ago when I was fresh out of college and um, I, uh, I was born in Romania, even though I don't live there anymore, but I started working there. And uh, 
The, the way that works is it's outsourcing. So I was basically rented by the hour to a, a different company. Uh, and then three weeks into my new job, my manager uh, comes to me and says, dude, uh, I have this team called Mozilla that does open source. Do you want to join them? I was like, what do you mean open source? What's that exactly? Uh, I had no idea what vo volunteering was. It, like, it wasn't even my, in my vocabulary. Uh, but we managed to make a deal. I was going to work for them for two weeks until they found someone else to replace me. Uh, and uh, then he was going to transfer me to the project I really, really wanted to work on, which is something that's maybe out there in the internet now, TripIt. Uh, so when I joined the team, it was right around Firefox 4, like we were releasing, launching Firefox 4 after about a year and a half of development. It was easy to get uh, excited about the project, like we had developer tools for the first time ever, even though it was just a console, uh, but that was developer tools. We had all these cool features like Panorama and stuff like that, so it was really easy to get interested in the project. The problem was the team wasn't really friendly and forthcoming and all that, so I kind of felt like an outsider because, well, they were testers, I was a developer in a tester team, and I kind of felt like the odd man out. Uh, but the project was interesting, so every morning what I did was I was reading a blog ag aggregator called the Mozilla Planet, and one morning, this post from the Mozilla Developer Network came in, and it said over the weekend they were doing a documentation sprint, and at the end of it, they were giving out T-shirts. Now, my problem was everybody in the team had a T-shirt except me, and this was my, like, my chance to get a T-shirt and feel like I belong, right? So I hacked up a plan. I was going to join for like two or three hours. Uh, or I was going to basically do, uh, do a little bit of documentation for them, get a t-shirt, which was also awesome because they had tester t-shirts, this was a developer t-shirt. I was going to rule their world. I was going to be the best of everything. Uh, and then I was going to go out and ha have fun with my friends. I was like, uh, out of college, employed, had money. What do you want? I want to party. And then the weekend comes around. Uh, I joined this IRC channel. They're kind of old school and still use IRC. Uh, so I joined this IRC channel, and uh, I start basically asking people what to do. And instead of, you know, like a manager comes to you and tells you, do this, do that, they're like, do anything you want. There's like a list of things that's available. If your thing isn't there, do whatever you want. I was like, what do you mean? I can do what I want and still get the T-shirt? So I started hacking on uh, examples instead of writing documentation. And then I figured... Uh, I figured out in the process, I figured out something weird. My friends called me and were like, come on, dude, let's go out, let's party. And I was like, no, 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 you're not getting it. I'm having fun with random people I met on the internet. Uh, so I ended up staying for like 48 hours straight, the whole, uh, like the whole thing. And uh, at the end of it, I realized I didn't actually stay for a t-shirt. Like six years later, I still don't have the t-shirt. Like the t-shirt got ruined in maybe a year. Uh, but I stayed around because, well, Open source had all these possibilities that my job wasn't affording me. And on top of that, I kind of felt like I belonged. I, I found a community that accepted me for who I was and whatever I wanted to do in the limits of decency. And that was a place where I could learn with others. And well, that's how I kind of felt. I found a missing piece in my puzzle. Like I, I started belonging somewhere. And that's why today, six years and a half later, I'm still going strong. I still see a bunch of people with Mozilla t-shirts in the audience. I have no idea who they are, but it's just like, we feel like we do the same thing somehow. Uh, and with that, I thank you. Hi, my name's Andrew Betts. I work for Farsi, and I also am on the W3C's technical architecture group. I am unhealthily interested in standards, and I hope to make you also unhealthily interested in standards. Um, I got here on an Airbus A319. This is a machine that has five million components. It cost me 10 pounds. Um, this is one of the great benefits of standardization and massive scale. Um, let's take a standard tour of standardization through the ages. Um, the Romans, excellent at standardization. They love to take almost everything from swords to armor to encampments to tents, scale it up, produce it thousands of times. It was a really good way of finding a good idea and having that good idea propagate through the whole empire. Fast forward to um, the Middle Ages, and we find Georg Christoph Luxemburg, one of my heroes, um, an inventor of paper, 
Uh, not in the Chinese sense, they managed to produce paper thousands of years before, but this guy came up with A4 paper, which is much more important, right? Because this is the paper that we all use, and it's so awesome, because he realized that you could take a piece of paper that measures one to the square root of two, cut it in half, and you've got two pieces of paper which also measure one to the square root of two, which means you can keep cutting the paper in half and get the next size down with no waste. And this system is now so amazing that it's used by literally every country in the world except America. <laughs> There's also the B size and the C size. The C sizes are designed to be exactly the right size to put the corresponding A size in as an envelope. Isn't that amazing? And the B size is halfway between two corresponding A sizes. Now, move forward. Trains arrived. Trains present us with a problem because when trains were invented, Cities had different times. When it was midday in London, it would be 11.50 in Bristol. And that's no good because we need timetables. We need to understand when the train is going to arrive um, at its destination. So we invented uh, time zones. And Sir Stanford Fleming was the chap who came up with this idea. Divide the world into 24 zones. And within each of one of those zones, the time would always be the same. And this principle. Um, basically works extremely well and we still use it today. There are only a few minor problems with this, mainly countries that don't respect standards, like China that has one time zone when it should have four, and India that has a 30 minute offset. India, what on earth are you thinking? Um, electricity was also a good opportunity for us to create new avenues for standardization. When electricity was first invented, if you had electricity, and you had something that worked on electricity, you couldn't take that thing to your neighbor and plug it in because it would probably explode because their electricity was different to your electricity. So when we finally managed to standardize this, we also standardized things like plugs and sockets. To this day, the BS1363 plug and socket system is one of the best plug and socket systems in the world, in my opinion. I agree. I agree it's a little bit big. Um, but we did gently encourage 36 other countries to adopt this system. And um, uh, it's also a good example of how we can innovate on top of legacy standards. So this is um, a Korean guy, Min Kyu Choi, who created a flat version of the British plug. So if you ever sat accidentally on a British three-pin plug, you will understand why this is a really important invention. <laughs> um, I can't talk to a load of nerds without mentioning HTTP and HTML. I have the pleasure of sitting in a room with this guy about once every three months and debating web standards. And when Tim invented HTTP and HTML in the late 80s, he wanted to make academic documents easier to cross-reference. But in doing so, he created something that was so, uh, such a ripe uh, hotbed of innovation that we ended up with far more creative uses for the web than he could ever possibly have imagined. And along the way, we've also created lots of uh, other standards and hardware innovations that have come on top of the things that have come out of the web. So USB, for example, is a fantastic hardware innovation which has taken a lot of people, a lot of very serious people, a lot of time, a lot of money to create, but it also enables you to plug all sorts of shit into your computer, like a guinea pig or a gun that will fire Nerf pellets at your coworkers. Other favorite standards include RFC 5841, which encodes emotion into internet packets so that your internet traffic can get emotional about delivering your internet experience to you. And ISO 3103, which defines an internationally standard way of making tea, which is amazing. Um, I think no matter whether you are talking about electricity, about transport, about furniture, about almost anything, every aspect of your life is improved by standardization. So I say let's not celebrate our differences. Let's celebrate all the stuff that's the same. Thank you very much. OK, so I wanted to tell you something about getting out of your comfort zone, the smart way. The smart way is probably not a real trademark, but uh, better safe than sorry, you know, with all the smart devices in the world. Uh, so let's start by laying some groundwork here. Uh, what actually is a comfort zone? Uh, the best way to make a lightning talk look smart is by putting a quote inside. So I put one, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. It's an accident that the previous lightning talk mentioned Romans as well. Uh, anyway, is this quote really random? Or maybe I want to tell you to go out and do opposite and do all the amazing and dangerous stuff. Yes, let's do this. Let's do even more dangerous stuff. Or maybe not. Because after all, it's a serious technological conference. 
And maybe we just chill out and take a programmer view on this topic. So I have a few questions for you. The first one, who remembers when you first started programming? Raise your hands. Okay, quite a few people here. And the next question is, how many of you were excited with all the new technologies you tried there and everything you could learn? Yeah, I just put 95% because I had to prepare it earlier. Uh, so let's go with it. Uh, anyway, we have five more circles. We can ask some more questions, but we won't. It's just a random background I found on the internet. Uh, so uh, moving on. Mm, we may feel like our daily job has little place for innovation because we're stuck in uh, trying to do stable working application. There is no place for uh, playground for creating some work in progress. But it may be possible to try new things within our job bounds. So let's take a look at some made up but entirely possible example. Uh, how about uh, if we have some uh, old database uh, and we want to migrate it into our shiny new Postgres Ruby on Rails application. Uh, and inside there are 100,000 users with millions of images, videos, comments. Uh, I don't know if you're working for Instagram, I'm not, so that's just out of the head. Uh, anyway, this, is, this sounds easy, right? Uh, you just grab your MySQL database, you connect it to your Ruby on Rails application, you create some simple rake task for it, and just shove everything into Postgres. Job done, great work. We can actually go home, but first we can start it and wait for it to finish. And actually you better do it when the weekend starts because it will take a staggering 60 hours to complete. So if nothing fails, you will have it ready by Monday. And some people will be okay with this. They will really go home and say, okay, it works, my job is done, what's the problem? Uh, and it's kind of sad because on Monday they will go back to work and they will be all depressed and say things like, why is my job so dull and repetitive? Uh, why is nothing innovative happening? Because they missed some opportunities to improve. There are small improvements you can do. This is, you know, the thumb up is international symbol for improvement according to stock photos. So uh, there are at least three improvements we can try to do here. The first one will be, for example, using SQL instead of active record. This way we can reduce memory footprint by over three times and, you know, Less memory footprint means faster code. If you want to work on this performance, you can try something like bulk insert. And if you don't want to dive into this, you can get a ready, a ready working solution. And actually we can just skip Rails entirely because you know it's really easy to export MySQL, uh, MySQL result into CSV file, and then you can load it into Postgres and it's blazing fast. And we can do some extra calculation if needed. We can just offset users so we don't override the existing ones. Uh, and we're still within our usual technological stack. So we just dived into the topic without stepping out of what we do in our daily job. And now, instead of 60 hours, this task will complete in just eight minutes. And that's really good improvement. And we just learned something new. We just expanded our knowledge. And that's what we were doing in the beginning. That's what got us into programming, and that's what can keep us running and uh, keep us moving. And afterwards, we can actually try jumping on the motorbike over the flames because it looks cool as hell. But if you want to discuss this topic or jumping on the motorbikes, you can find me on the internet, on the Slack channel, Twitter, or anywhere. Thank you. Thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, I want to quickly talk to you about uh, scalability from cost perspective. Um, and just my background, uh, real quick, I'm CTO of an ad tech company called RTKIO. Previously, um, I ran the world's second largest consumer VPN company. Um, and I do a lot of work, consulting work on scalability, um, security and scalability for content delivery networks, uh, financial institutions, and governments. So. Why do I care so much about this? Well, all of you here are probably building really awesome tech, and a lot of you are probably building them on the same platforms. Uh, maybe you're using AWS, maybe you're using Azure, um, and that might be okay for the business that you're running. But for some of us, that may not be okay. And so I wanna to talk to you uh, from the perspective of just thinking about 
when you achieve scale, can you still afford to operate the platform that you're operating today? So when I talk about scale, this is my perspective. Some people's scale is much larger than this, some may be smaller. But I come from an area where we serve about a billion impressions per day. Um, in the ad tech side, we've done deep, app, deep packet inspection for over 100,000 simultaneous sessions um, at 50 gigabits of traffic sustained. So these are costly projects. Um, no, no matter how you look at it, your, your infrastructure costs will be high. So, touched on this quickly, but why do we really care? Because in the long-term survivability for your company, um, all things eventually get commoditized when it comes to technology. So everything is kind of a race to the bottom. And so if your offering is purely technology, um, you need to really understand what that means to operate at a commoditized level. Um, what happens when your competitor is the person that's operating uh, the infrastructure that you're built on top of? The other reason this is really important is because money is generally better invested outside of the tech realm. And I know that really doesn't sound good for us, but like, it really is. Because if I have an extra thousand dollars I can spend in marketing, I would rather do that to grow my business than invest it in unnecessary technology investment. Now this is just maybe my personal bias, but from what I've seen, uh, growing your business is way, way easier when you have an extra marketing budget. So, quick real world example. Uh, in the world of ad tech, you have this concept of real-time bidding. These auctions are happening inside your browser, which is ridiculous, but people are bidding in real time to serve you an ad. Every time you see an ad on a, on a website, most likely up to 10 different ad exchanges have competed for that impression and given a price. So what does that mean for the bidder? Well, they need to be able to do this very quickly. Um, a lot of times they'll have an auction uh, between their back-end partners before they participate in the auction in your browser. So they need to do this fast twice, and they need to do this um, in a way that's very uh, smart. So they don't want to bid on the wrong user, uh, because bidding on the wrong user means wasting lots of resources, uh, participating in bids that they probably shouldn't participate in. So let's think of this from the perspective of you're going to start an ad exchange or you want, want to participate uh, in the world of online advertising. Well, if the two largest players in the market are Google and Amazon, can you really be cost competitive in the advertising world if you're building your platform on top of Google and Amazon? Maybe you can, but I would, I would bet that you can't. So what are some other common cost scale problems that I see when people are making architecture decisions. Um, really, there's a lack of continuous cost modeling throughout the entire systems development cycle. And we, we use bandwagon band-aids, so we think that the latest technology and scale is gonna fix our scalability problems. We haven't tested those for actual cost effectiveness. Uh, we have the provider lock-in problem. And um, a lot of times, developers don't make great architects, so we need to bring, make sure we're always at the table together. Uh, some things you can do to re reduce your chance of failure is just understand your traffic patterns, test everything from a cost perspective, understand your performance metrics, set them early, and uh, identify those resource components um, that really consume the, the most dollars in your architecture. Um, thank you very much, and feel free to talk to me after.